Hello, everybody, and welcome to Think You Know Wine. This is going to be such an amazing evening. I'm your host, as always, Renee Sperazza, and I'm here with the Wine Align Critic team. We are going to be blind tasting some wines tonight. Wine Align is Canada's largest wine review site, and these guys redu- review thousands upon thousands of wines, more than I've ever reviewed in my lifetime, even per month, which is absolutely astounding and amazing. Our critics are going to be tasting through more wines than we normally do this time. Like we said, it's a special evening. And as you can see from the looks on all of their faces, they are super excited about it. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) our critics are going to be able to score 10 points per wine. They can score three points for varietal, two for the country, one for the region, one for Appalachian, two for vintage, plus or minus a year, we might take off a point and one point for the price within a 30% range, 15% above and 15% below. So let's get everything kicking off. Our critics that are joining us tonight are first off, John Zavo. Welcome, John. Thank you for joining us. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back, everyone. <laughs> Lovely to see you. Amazing. We also have David Larison. Thank you for joining us, David. Good evening, Good evening everyone. Looking forward to a long night. A uh, good night, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, Sarah Delmato joining us. Welcome, Sarah. Hello, cheers everyone. Thanks for joining us. And we have uh, Michael Goodell. Michael, thanks for joining us this evening. Thanks, Renee. Buonasera. Buonasera. And again, everyone. I must have gotten distracted from the, the, the length of the evening as well. We're going to have a fun time for sure, but we're going to kick it off with what's in your glass. John, what's in your glass this evening? I hear you have a really interesting wine. Wow. An absolute gem of a wine from the exotic location of Vienna right in within the town boundaries of Vienna. It's uh, it's called Gemischter Satz, which is just so much fun to say, which means which means mixed set, but it means literally field blend. So this is a traditional style Viennese wine with nine different vi- varieties, all planted in the same vineyard willy nilly, harvested at the same time, stuck in the same vat and fermented. And it's uh, delicious from Fritz Winninger from his Ried so it's a single vineyard on the Neusberg Hill overlooking Vienna. And it's a gorgeous place to go. Why? Because you can sit in his little tavern, his Heurige, and drink lots of this delicious wine and eat some local Viennese food specialties. And can I say one more thing? Totally unrelated, but I'm really excited because we just put together this Cru Beaujolais pack through the Wine Line Exchange, a passport case. And uh, I remember the first time I tasted all of the crews of Beaujolais together, same vintage, same producer. It was a really fascinating journey through the different terroirs of Julianas, Moulin, Vent, Bruy, Côte de Bruy. So anyone who's out there, all you wine students, you got to get yourself a, a pack of this wine because it is an, a brilliant opportunity. Stéphane Aviron is the producer, great producer, works with Nicolas Potel, and it's all 2019, six different crews made exactly the same way. So the only difference in the glass is from the site itself, all old wine. So anyhow, just had to mention that, totally unrelated. No, it's totally worth it. Look, Wine Align is trying to do you all a favor. They're getting you the cheapest ticket to Beaujolais that you can get on the market, and it just comes straight to your house. You don't even have to go anywhere. Cheapest flight to Beaujolais ever I've experienced in my life. We're gonna go over to David. David, what's in your glass this evening? Well, I've got a rosé tonight, and it comes from the Okanagan Valley. Uh, There's a very interesting new line of wine. It's not a new winery. Uh, The line's called Foxley, and and you may know of her or have heard of Foxtrot, which is a Naramata bench uh, Pinot Noir Chardonnay producer, uh, doing some of the best Pinots in Canada, actually. And they've uh, had this uh, offshoot line called Foxley. These are sort of $20 to $25 wines. Um, And this is a a rosé. Of course, I thought it was Pinot based, but it's not. It's 95% Pinot Gris with skin contact and 5% Zweigelt, which is a a lighter colored red. So very creative idea. It really works. And it's a a beautiful dry rosé. Well, that's absolutely fantastic. Sounds delicious. Let's go over to Sarah. Sarah, what's in your glass this evening? Well, do you remember how we got, or at least I did, I think everybody got excited about the Frappato last week. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so Brian gave us this really nice gift this week. I know there was no more of the Planeta left and nobody can find it. And I, I know there was a lot of frenzy about it in the, in the chat. Um, but what Brian did was able to find here is from Kuss. And remember, I think it was John, you had mentioned this, it was John or Michael, um, when you were asked uh, some of the, you know, the top producers 
products, and this is certainly one of them. So this is a, a frappato from the Living Vine Agency. Uh, it's organically produced. It is, uh, they use a lot of biodynamic uh, tendencies here too, and uh, experiment with amphora. So these are pretty intriguing wines. And this one is, uh, it really falls in line, uh, you know, and it's, Talking about lighter summery reds as the temperature goes up, uh, those Beaujolais that John was mentioning in the case, you know, are going to be fantastic crackers for the summer. But this is also a nice option, lower alcohol, fresh, even with a slight chill. I just actually took it out of the fridge. It's perfect. And again, the, the, these wines are absolutely amazing. And, and everybody, if you can't find them at the LCBO, keep in mind that you can always order a case from the people that bring it in, which is always a great option because who doesn't want a case of wine? Anyway, we're gonna go over to Michael as our last, our last critic to tell me what's in his glass this evening. Michael, what is in your glass? What can you get? Can you guess what's in my glass? <laughs> I'm gonna guess <laughs> Riesling. Like? I'm guessing that Riesling. That is Riesling, that's what's in my glass. So I have a little bit of a love affair with New York wines, I gotta be honest with you. North Fork, South Fork, Hudson Region, I don't care, but also Finger Lakes. About eight years ago, I think it's eight years ago, during the summer, I was on a fam took my family on a drive to the East Coast and back, and we stopped in at Watkins Glen at the bottom of Seneca Lake. Beautiful hotel at the bottom of the lake. We stayed there. I went and did some visits around some of the most famous vineyards in the, in the area, including Dr. Constantine Frank and Herman Weimer and et cetera, et cetera. And, um, I found this winery called Shaw Vineyards, very, very tiny on the west side of the lake. They made, uh, made some great Riesling, drank some old stuff from the early 2000s, and I was really kind of impressed with the longevity. So this is Wagner Vineyards, or Wagner. Um, there's a lot of German in the, in the Finger Lakes. And this is my little segue to talk about my colleagues, John and Sarah, who two weeks from tonight are going to do a cocktail hour, just like we're doing now, at the same time, on May the 15th at 5 p.m., for New York wines. Uh, so the uniqueness of New York wines is really worth talking about, really worth exploring, and they're gonna lead us through an incredible hour of that ilk. So everybody join in, look forward to it. It's and yes, everybody, great. you know what that means, that next, uh, two weeks from now, John and Sarah are gonna be doing this, same time, same place. So we're not gonna be having Think You Know Wine, but please stay tuned for our next episode. We are so excited to be doing this with all of you. And uh, before we get into everything, I just want to let everyone know that has joined us at this point that we have a little bit of a different um, kind of plan this evening. Our repertoire this evening includes a lot more wines than ever before. So just to keep the, in mind to our audience this evening, we're going to be sending our, our critics off to the lounge in just a moment, just to keep in mind to our audience this evening, to keep your questions short. We have so many wines this evening. I'm going to try and get to every question I can. We're going to keep it a little bit more of a tighter program. That being said, we absolutely love all of your questions and we want to answer as many of them as we can. So if you have a question that wasn't answered this evening, please feel free to head to Wine Align and send it through their contact. They would love to hear everything that you guys have to say, every question that you have. We're absolutely delighted about it. So critics, if you could pull out wine number one and show it to our wonderful people at home. Awesome. And we're going to send you off to the critics lounge to get as little bit of that wine going while we find out what the first wine is before you guys. All right, so our first wine for tonight is the Flat Rock Cellars Riesling. It is the 2018 vintage. The varietal is Riesling. It's from Ontario, Canada, and it's from the Niagara Peninsula. The appellation is Niagara. The, the Niagara Escarpment, the 20 mile bench, VQA area, and the vintage is 2018. The price is $17.95. And we are so happy that this wine is sponsored by Wine Country Ontario. So we'll get our critics back in the room. And just a reminder to everybody in our chat this evening, please do not give our critics any hints. We've made this evening particularly hard. We would like them to work really hard about it too. So no, no, no hints in the chat, everybody. All right, so we're gonna kick everything off. Critics, how are we feeling? We're looking pretty confident. Let's, Sarah, I saw the thumbs up. Let's go over to you first. What are your first thoughts on wine number one? All right, I should know by now. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, this is a very recognizable grape that's in the glass and I'm glad that we're starting off 
here because we've got a bit of a way to go yet tonight. Um, so it's a, an aromatic grape variety. It's grown in a cooler climate, um, but it is also grown in many different cool climate and great cool climates across the globe. So I think the trick with this one is going to be narrowing down where exactly it's from. Um, there is a bit of residual sugar and um, that can sometimes be a hint, but you know, this variety done in many places can have residual sugar and it can't be dry. So we'll have to think about that one while my colleagues voice their opinions. Yes, let's go over to John next. John, what is your first thoughts on wine number one? I think Sarah's pretty much covered off everything there. Clean, fresh, young, unoaked white wine with a little bit of residual sugar, high acid, citrus fruit. There are only a few places or a few grapes that you would find in that style. I think of Chenin Blanc, off dry style from the Loire, for example, Riesling obviously fits into that mold. So uh, we're really in a narrow varietal spectrum, but when it comes to region of origin, man, we've got a lot of uh, cool climates to choose from where those varieties are grown and, and perform pretty well. So that's gonna be the game here, narrowing down the origin, I think. I love that. Very on point with the evening. Michael, what are your first thoughts on wine at number one? Well, I think my esteemed colleagues have pretty much nailed it. There's not much more I need to say, really. Although there is a little bit of a reductive slash sulfide character on the nose that really needs some air, needs to blow off, which is not surprising. It's not uh, just a little bit of protective shell for this beautiful wine. Um, and while it is an aromatic grape variety, I actually don't find this overtly aromatic. And again, I think it's a little bit of that reduction uh, and or sulfide that needs to, needs to get away, needs to blow off into the air. So um, let's give it lots of agitation, lots of swirl. For those of you who have this in your glass, give it, give it as much uh, shaken up as you can. There we go. All right, David, what is your first thoughts on wine number one? Well, it's, it's a lovely wine, and what really strikes me about it is the complexity, actually. I mean, we've, my colleague have talked about the, you know, it's, it's off dry, uh, love the acidity, I love the acid sugar balance, but I really love the, the aromatics of this wine. Um, and it's suggesting to me it's a little bit of maturity as well. I'm um, getting sort of the classic fruits and, and florals, there's a little honeyed note. Um, and there's a spice I get with this particular grape variety from some places when the wines are, are when the vines are older and the wines are a little bit mature. So um, I, was, I was just sort of grooving on the flavors more than anything else. And um, also made a note, middle note, that I think the alcohol is maybe a little bit lighter than normal, which is really adding to the sense of elegance and balance in the wine. You've picked up a lot of clues on that one. All right, we're gonna go back over to Sarah. Sarah, what is wine <laughs> number one? Well, thank you to John, Michael, and David, because I think you've just given me the little tidbits that I need to <laughs> solidify my voices <laughs> here. Um, it was where I was heading, but I'm glad I feel much more confident now. So this is a Riesling. And um, I was trying to decide whether this was going, this was coming from Niagara or if it was coming from um, Germany, but I've landed on Germany. Um, and I think it's really because of the lightness of alcohol and I was in the Mosul direction and generally Rieslings from the Mosul tend to be a little bit lighter in alcohol and this one really does feel like that. I think it gets its a mouth feel and its texture from the uh, slight amount of residual sugar. So, you know, probably at a cabinet level um, of, uh, of ripeness here, but maybe a, a couple years of age. So I do think that this is a Riesling from Germany, from the Mosul Valley. Um, and I think that the vintage on this is probably, ooh, I'm thinking 2019, maybe 2018, let's say 2018. Um, and the price on this is $27. Thank you so much, Sarah. John, back over to you. What is wine number one? I don't know, Renee. <laughs> really? You have to ask me now. All right. So I, do. Uh, I know I know the answer, but like you have to tell me it. So it's Riesling, thousand percent. I'm pretty confident about that. And after this, it gets a little bit dodgy. Uh, you know, Mosul is a great call. Power of suggestion, Finger Lakes even came to mind. Thank you for, for throwing me down that uh, rabbit hole, Michael. Um, I don't think it's from the Finger Lakes. Niagara makes a lot of sense as well. This is a cool climate, 
cool climate Riesling with a little bit off, off dry residual sugar. So anyhow, I know we've, we're under the gun for time. I'm going to go 2019 Niagara Peninsula Riesling 1995. Fantastic. And a vintage. 2019. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed that there. My bad. I apologize for that. All right. We're going to go over to Michael. Michael, what is wine number one? I don't know. You, oh, sorry, you've already heard line. this excuse. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> okay, so uh, two thousand percent. This is Riesling, right? And it's not Riesling. It is not from uh, volcanic soil somewhere in Hungary above Lake Balaton. It is from Niagara, as far as I'm concerned. So Canadian Riesling, Niagara, Ontario. That's in the wrong order, but you get the drift. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to be very specific. I think this is from up on the Niagara Escarpment, uh, specifically the Beamsville Bench. Um, I think it's 1995 as well, just like John said, and I actually think it's a different vintage. I think it's 2018. Um, something, something about something someone said early on led me to think it's actually got an extra year on it. <laughs> All right, and over to David. David, what is wine number one? Okay, so we've got uh, two, well, Riesling, uh, well, say 3000%, uh, but we're, we've got a tie here now between you know, Germany and Niagara. Uh, and it's really difficult to sort that out, frankly. So it, this is a real leap of faith. Uh, I'm going to join Sarah and go to Germany on it. Uh, I thought Mosul as well, but there's this lovely ripe fruit sort of fleshiness and juiciness that re reminds me of Rheinhessen. Um, but I thought, no, it's, it's not quite, it, it's a little bit more steely than that. But aha, there's a little region between the Moselle and, and Rheinhessen called the Nahe Valley. Um, and this could well be from there. Uh, so that's going to say Nahe, N-A-H-E. Uh, I'm going to go, uh, again, I think it's a bit mature, so 2017, I'm almost thinking 2016, but I'll go 17, and it's about $30. Awesome. Absolutely amazing. All right. Are you guys ready to find out what wine number one is? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Da -da, da -da, Never da -da. We have the... Flat Rock Cellars, 2018, Riesling from Ontario, from the Niagara Peninsula, the Niagara Escarpment, the 20 mile bench area, actually, 2018 and 1795. That is the wine for tonight. I'm gonna get the scoring wizards to bring up the score right away. Well done, gentlemen. Well done. Oh, Michael with the perfect score over here. Fantastic. We have John in second place, followed by Sarah and followed by David. Great job right off the bat, everyone. So we have uh, we have a couple of, we have a question in the chat that I want to get to right away. Michael, you spoke about saying that this wine is a bit reductive in style. What do you mean by that? So, I mean, generally speaking, we mean that uh, during the winemaking process, uh, winemakers are either making wines for the most part in either a reductive or an oxidative style. That's the introduction of oxygen to the ferment, depending on the timing of doing so. And um, in, in this case, why I smell reductive is, is a little bit of a, of a, just of a closed character to me that can come across as being almost like sulfur, but it can also come across as being, uh, hmm, I'll let John t take over from that of what else he, because he, he's more of a chemist than I am. And he can tell you more about what that smell will be like, but it, it, it keeps the one, it's, it's a freshness factor really more than anything. John, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, it's a really complex chemical uh, discussion here, oxidation reduction, the potential of, of any wine, but to simplify it, what we're really talking about are volatile sulfur compounds, and we describe those as flinty, we describe those, I actually wrote down a little rubber hose uh, on my tasting note here, because it can sometimes go in that direction, in any way, it's not fruity. And there are ways you can enhance this character in the winery uh, using certain techniques. Uh, and it's, it's relatively common in Riesling, particularly wild fermented Riesling, because when yeast struggle, they kick out as a byproduct these volatile sulfur compounds. So hopefully that didn't confuse anyone too much, but uh, I agree with Michael, it certainly shows some of that character. But you also get that in the Mosul, you get that in the Nahe, you get that in Rheingau, you get that in Eden Valley, you get that all over the world. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, 
Goring Wizard, this is just a question for you and you can message it to me directly. Why did John not get 10? That is the question that's literally listed here. So Goring Wizard, question. if you could if you could just message me that, then I will say the answer out loud to everyone. So anyone that's asking that, I will find out, I promise. Michael was uh, on the escarpment there. He was practically parked at Flat Rock Cellars when he made his judgment there. So yeah, you deserve that. You could very much, you could have taken a point away from me for saying Beamsville Bench, right? For going too far. <laughs> I think that the scoring wizards are going to be a little bit uh, generous this evening. Who who knows? Who knows? All right. We have one more question for, we have two more questions for this, and then we're going to move forward. Uh, Sarah and David, why, now that you know that the, wine, that, that the wine is what it is, why not Alsace? I know you guys said Germany, but why not Alsace? Sarah, you go ahead. Um, well, Alsace, uh, you know, I would be looking for something a little bit drier. That's not to say that Alsatian Rieslings don't have any residual sugar. In fact, they do more than you think. But um, stylistically speaking, you know, if you had to make a choice in a blind tasting, you would look towards uh, something uh, lighter and, um, uh, you know, so lower in alcohol, higher in sugar as, as Germany. But also Alsace, where, um, where Riesling is grown, tends to be a little bit warmer. Warmer. And so you would expect a little bit more ripeness and a little bit more mouthfeel as well. So, pass. yeah, I just said Alsatian Rieslings would generally have more alcohol than is evident in this wine. Amazing. Thank you. And I have an answer for John. And we have one more question. So, apparently, John got the vintage wrong, which dropped him down by a point. And Michael said 2018. John said 2019. So, there we go. That's the difference there. Last question we have is. Uh, is the diesel nose on some Riesling the sulfur you are talking about, or is that something else, that petrol vibe? So if anyone can provide a quick, John's shaking his head, we'll, we'll go to him first. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a different compound that arises in Riesling, but not only Riesling, some other varieties. It's called TDN, trihydrodynaphthalene, something like that. And that's what gives uh, Rieslings and similar wines that petrol-like nose. And it arises under various conditions in the vineyard. Amazing. Not, not All right. So I'm sorry, everyone, but if you had another question, please submit it to the Wine Align team. We have Michael coming in as the fan favorite for tonight. So let's see if he can live up to that as we continue to go. We're going to get our critics to, sorry, no pressure, Michael. Uh, we're going to get our critics to get into wine number two. If you guys could just show the little vials to our wonderful audience over here. And then we're going to send you guys back into the critics lounge. So ciao, ciao, critics. We'll see you again in just a moment. All right. Wine number two is the Malivoire Chardonnay. It's the 2018 vintage again. It is from Ontario. It is from the Niagara Peninsula. And this, is, this one is actually from the Beamsville bench area of the Niagara Escarpment. 2018 and the price is $19.95. As you can tell everyone, we have a bit of a theme this evening. This wine was sponsored by Wine Country Ontario. So we're gonna bring our critics right back into the room. All right, welcome back critics. How are we doing with wine number two? Are we feeling, we feeling confident or oh, we're missing John? Oh no, we have John, there he is. Sorry, I didn't there see you there for a moment. You were covered by my chat box screen. John, you're looking confident. Why don't we start off with you for wine number two? What are your first thoughts? I think it's youthful. I think it's pretty fresh. It's slightly candied. I'm sensing a little bit more sunshine than the previous wine, also a little bit more alcoholic warmth. I'm thinking this is a fairly aromatic variety. And also there's a telltale, uh, vaguely bitter sensation on the finish. And I don't mean that in a negative sense, but it's something you find quite common, commonly with aromatic varieties. They have this little bitterness that actually freshens up the wine further because the acids are pretty tender. The fruit's pretty tender. It's pretty ripe, mostly or orchard fruit, almost slipping into the candied fruit spectrum. And um, I'm still kind of working through the possibilities here, I have to say. So uh, that's it for now. That's okay. You're first. You have time. We're going to go over to Michael. Michael, what are your first thoughts on wine number two? Michael, you are on mute. <laughs> so sorry. So there we go. You put yourself back on mute. <laughs> buying time. He's buying time. There we go. There <laughs> Thanks, we go. You're Michael. Good. You're good. That's where I, that's where I hit the button 17 times. That might be the problem. 
<laughs> no, no, what I was saying is, it's almost like I'm inside John's head or, or vice versa here, because you know, the first thing I wrote was in quotations, faux sugary. And that to me is, is a really ripe and fresh aromatic white wine that almost gives the impression of sweetness. But mm -hmm. it's an aromatic sweetness. It's not that it's a sweet wine. It's not that there's sugar in the wine, but it actually gives that impression away. So I definitely don't think that there's a lot of barrel or oak, if any, uh, mask in this wine. It's pretty much open it, ready for business, wants to tell you what it is. Um, but it, it could be a bit of a chameleon of a grape variety or grape varieties. Um, and that little bitter tinge on the finish reminds me of, of almond, very much so. So that, that, that helps steer me in. 25 or six directions. Yes, exactly. Very good on that front. All right, we're going to go over to David. David, what are your first thoughts on wine number two? My first thoughts are that this is a mysterious wine. <laughs> this is this is difficult. Um, and one of the reasons I found it difficult is that I actually found the aromatics uh, quite low, like low intensity aromatics. Um, I agree. I don't think there's any barrel going on here. We're into fair, a warmer region, I would think, because of the sort of more, you know, ripe, ripe orchard fruit or tropical fruit aromas. Acid is medium to low, um, and there's a, a, little, a little bit of heat. Um, so I think it's a warm climate wine, but I really am hoping Sarah can give me a clue as to what the grape is. All right, Sarah, what are your first thoughts on wine number two? You can you can do what David said or otherwise, I know what I would do, but uh, what are your first thoughts? Well, geez, I mean, this was tricky for me right off the bat. Um, I There is some acidity, but it's not, you know, it's not rip roaring. Um, I So many grapes are going through my mind. At one point I thought maybe Semillon, could it be? Uh, I even thought of Chenin Blanc. Um, Chardonnay even, because I was feeling that a faint hint of oak here. I do feel like there is some oak. It's not a lot of oak, as Michael mentioned. I mean, you know, um, it's, um, but I, I feel like it's there. It could be older berries. There's just a little bit of toastiness in this one. And I thought maybe it could be Gruner, um, given the almond and a little bit of that white pepper spiciness. But um, it's it's a it's subdued. It's uh, it's tricky. This one. I'm glad I'm last on this <laughs> this particular wine uh, here. It gives me a little bit more time to make up my mind. Well, you're welcome. Uh, so we're gonna go back over to John. John, I, I, what's wine? What is wine number two? You're looking confident. Or you're looking like you're upset with me. Either I, it might be both. Uh, what is what? It's the second. Okay. What is wine number two? I've got it all figured out. Oh, great. <laughs> I was nervous there for a while because I had no idea, but now I know exactly what it is. All right, you ready for this? Yep. I am going on a complete flyer here, and by all means, don't follow me down this trail, my, my colleagues. So uh, I think this is a wine from California. That's in the United States of America on the West Coast. I think the warm climate is Central Coast-ish. And the, the confusion over the varieties can be resolved by the fact that it's not a varietal wine. There are several varieties at play here. I think it's a Rhone style blend. A little Marsan, a little Roussan, a little Viognier. And I'll leave it at that, maybe some Grenache Blanc. I can't think for the life of me who makes this style of wine from the, from the Central Coast in California, but that's what it reminds me of, 2018. And you know, it's Cali, so you're gonna pay a bit. I'm gonna say $29. All right, fantastic. And what vintage did you say? I said 2018. Fantastic. Thank you so much, John. All right, we are going to move over to Michael. Michael, what is wine number two? Oh, this one's this one's a bit of this one's a bit of an enigma. Um, but I had a first impression, and I'm going to stick with it on this one. So I also think this wine is from California. Uh, I also think it's from the Central Coast, but I think it's Chardonnay. And California Chardonnay, when there's not a lot of oak and to me can come out like this. So I'm gonna stick with that. I'm gonna say Central Coast 2019 and I think it's $26. Fantastic, thank you so much, Michael. We're gonna go over to David. David, what is wine number two? Still making up my mind as I open my mouth. <laughs> All right, it's, it's, it's let's, a tough one. let's see what, um, what so I'm gonna, I'm, gonna do what, I'm gonna do what Michael did and go with my first impression. Um, I, as I said, I think this is a hot climate wine. I think it's a Mediterranean wine. I don't think the alcohol is quite high enough for 
what I'd expect from California. Um, so what varieties, probably a blend uh, that would include, I mean, the grape I thought of first actually was Grenache Blanc, um, but there may be others in there, could be Roussin as well, um, and, and other sort of white Mediterranean varieties. So let's just say a white Rhone blend, even though it might be from Spain. Um, but I'm gonna go to the, um, to the Rhone Valley um, and it'll just be, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's not a white shot de pop. It doesn't have the kind of depth or, or whatever to be that. So just a white uh, Cote de Rhone. Uh, and uh, it's, the length is fairly short on it, I find. So I'm not gonna go very high on the price, maybe about 1995 and a 2019 vintage. Fantastic, thank you. And we're gonna go over to Sarah. Sarah, we have some Rhone warriors and we have some other vibes going on. Where, where are you sitting with this? What, what is wine number two? Yeah, so one of the things that, that really, I, I will, I want to say Chardonnay here because of the creaminess and the texture and a little bit of oak, but it's just, it's not, it's not screaming enough Chardonnay to me. And I think that, that David and John are, you know, are correct in this Rhone, these Rhone varieties. And one of the reasons is this peach note about it. There's this a little bit of this peach character to it, this fleshy peach, this ripe peach that I can't get past, and it could very, very well be Rome for us. I was actually thinking of Viognier. Um, at one point, I was thinking Viognier from the Long Duck, but it's just too hot there. It's, it would be much more expressive than, than this. Um, so I, I'm going to say a white blend, and I'm going to say a cooler part of the Southern Rhone, Costière de Nîmes. And um, so a white blend from Costière de Nîmes. In, in France, um, I think that, I don't think it's got a lot of age to it. I'll say 2019. And I think the price on this is um, $20. Thank you so much, Sarah. All right, let, let's see what wine, we wanna see what wine number two is everybody, critics, are you ready for this? All right, wine number two, doo -doo -doo, is, Malavoir's Chardonnay <laughs> 2018 vintage. Wow. Uh, Niagara Peninsula. This time the beams, the Beamsville bench on the escarpment. And like I said, it's 2018. The price is $19.95. Are we surprised? Yeah. Yep. Well done. Yep. Good one. Great, great are, job, are we, everyone. We're we gonna sure? get our, our, our we scoring sure wizard to pull up the scores really quickly. Did you say 18 was the vintage? 2018, yes. Okay. All right, so for our, our scores right now, we have Michael in the lead. I, I feel that is because you said Chardonnay, Michael. So you yeah, are now likely. sitting at 14 points. Uh, we have John coming in second with 11, followed by Sarah with seven and David with six. So we can just pull that down really quickly. All right, yes, and John, you were gonna say something. Sorry about that. <laughs> I was just questioning the scoring wizard behind the behind the screen there. Are we sure that's what was in vial number two? I feel like a thousand percent sure. Because that's a pretty exotic and ripe um, Chardonnay from Niagara, I have to say. I have I mean, to admit, I was I was thinking it was a, a blend with Chardonnay and a little bit of Chardonnay Musquet in it, even myself tasting it in the glass, because it had a very different aspect than what I was personally expecting. So what, what you guys were saying. the alcohol saying, in there, Renee? The alcohol level in the bottle, what the does it say? The alcohol level is 12.5% and Ooh. it just says Chardonnay. So that's, well, that's I know it. it's quite I'm surprising. Calling, I'm calling Shiraz right after the show. I want the details. <laughs> yes. I bet you there's a new stay in there and it's not 12.5% alcohol. It tastes a lot warmer than that. All right, you, he, John is going to call the winemaker and figure it out. Everybody that's in our chat, please feel free to submit your questions now if you'd like. I'm going to go to uh, to David. You said that this was a Rhone varietal, a uh, Rhone-based wine. What made you go to Old World Rhone instead of the Rhone Warrior style that comes out of uh, California versus John? Yeah, I, I just thought it was a little bit lighter. As I said, I expect would expect a California wine of this type to be uh, more full-bodied, richer, sort of a thicker, creamier, almost greasier texture to it. Uh, this still has some delicacy and, and a little bit of minerality uh, to it, um, some, some poise. It just didn't feel like a big, rich California wine. Exactly. Um, Sarah, you were on the same boat with that. Like, what made you go there as well? Similar to David? 
Um, I probably should have stayed with that little inkling of a Chardonnay, obviously. Now, you know, what's interesting is that the wine in the glass now, as it warms up, I can, I feel the barrel more. I feel the caramel. It's starting to come out. I was actually cupping my hands, trying to warm this up when the, the guys were talking about it, just trying to get something that I wasn't, uh, that I wasn't tasting before. Anyway, um, it's uh, deceptively lower in alcohol, actually. Uh, there's a lot of mouthfeel to this. There's, a, there's some nice texture to this wine. So yeah, that's all I can say. <laughs> and Michael, how good does it feel to call Chardonnay in this round? Well, I said that was my first impression. It's interesting. Someone just wrote in the chat uh, that uh, Ontario can do things that pleases California wine lovers. And I think that's exactly what we're seeing here. The magic of uh, Malavoir and Shiraz Mati or their winemaker. Uh, he's, he's really a master at, at, at the subtleties of uh, varietal subtleties, working with oak, masking, making it look like it's not there at all. I mean, it's really, it's brilliant. I mean, it's, we're, it's really impressive work. And it's funny because some of the things I said in the preamble were should have led me more to, to Ontario than to California for this. But um, it was this richness without oak that led me to California, as if it was a an unoaked California Chardonnay. But Niagara makes Beansville Bench makes a lot of sense. And we do have a lot coming in from our from from our audience as well. Just that this is a surprising wine across the board. Uh, and uh, everybody, try a more Canadian wine. It, this this is a great this is a great surprise to have in the glass, and uh, it's a really lovely production. So we are going to move on to wine number three this evening. Critics, if you can pull out your vials of mystery, there we go. Wine number three, vial of mystery, amazing. Great. All right, and we're gonna put you guys in the Critics Lounge and we'll see you guys in just a minute. All right, so our, our uh, next wine up for today, wine number three is going to be the Hidden Bench Pinot Noir. The great bridal is Pinot Noir. It is from Ontario. It's from the Niagara Peninsula. It is also from the Beamsville Bench in the Niagara Escarpment. 2019 is the vintage and 34.95 is the price for today. And this is sponsored by Wine Country Ontario as well. Remember everybody to not give anything away in the chat. Awesome, welcome back critics. I'm just gonna give you guys all a reminder that you come back on mute. So whenever you would like to unmute yourselves and I'll give you just a, a, a quick moment here to get yourself settled in. All right, so we are going to go over and start off with our first thoughts on wine number three. And I am going to go to Michael first because he smiled and uh, this, is, <laughs> this is how this works. <laughs> this is how this works. Love this wine. Yay, what this are your one first in my thoughts? <laughs> um, what I love, aside from the fact the, the varietal love that I'm that I'm getting here. Um, there's a little bit of tiny bit of astringency, some anxiety, some tension uh, right on the nose on this, which I'm very happy about. It says something about sense of place. Um, I mean, it could be from lots of places in the world, but um, the at source varietal wine here to me seems pretty obvious. Cherries, fruit, pit, stone, skin, a little bit musky. I love all that. So. Next. All right, Next fantastic. Up. So Michael is happy and we're gonna move over to David. David, what are your first thoughts on wine number three? Well, I think it's a pretty classy example of the grape, I think it is, um, and, uh, and, and cool, a cooler climate uh, example of it. Uh, although it's not, um, it's not green at all, you know. Um, I, I, love, I love the aromatics, which is one of the, my favorite things about this grape and the complexity it provides. So you're in the, in the red fruits, uh, sort of sour cherry, uh, cranberry, which is one of my favorite uh, fruit juices, um, that kind of thing. There's there's this lovely sort of forest floor, spice, uh, really nicely handled background wood. Um, so again, I'm really enjoying the aromatics of the wine. I agree with Michael. There's there's a real tension to this one. There's a bit of tannin, uh, a bit more tannin than I might expect from this variety in most places. So that's kind of throwing me a little bit as to as to where it's from. Amazing. Well, hopefully you figure that out by the time we get to yeah, your hopefully. answer. We are going to go over to Sarah next. Sarah, what are your first thoughts on wine number three? Yeah, so my first thought on this was this is a, a Burgundian variety, red variety, and yet there's more than one. There's more than one. There, there are two. And sometimes actually these 
these grapes can be confused um, with one another. Uh, that's uh, especially if they're made in a, a fresher, lighter style. Um, I have this, ever since I found out what uh, the last wine is, I have this unease in my head that maybe this, this, this episode has a regional theme about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I say this because this is actually a grape that does very well locally here in Niagara as well too. And my goodness, now, you know, if this third one is also from Niagara, I think we've nailed this theme. <laughs> this is what it is. That's all I'll say. That's too much. I've said too much. Uh, Sarah's going down a particular pathway with her thought processes, and we're going to go over to John. John, what are your first thoughts on wine number three? Well, I, I love all the smoke and mirrors from my colleagues here who are dancing around the issue, dancing around the variety, talking but not saying anything about it. I, since I'm going last, I, I mean, you know, for me, this is this is Pinot Noir. This is pretty classic, not cool climate, not warm climate. It's somewhere in between. And uh, I guess that will be the crux of the matter. But other than that, everything else just points that variety from the color, the flavor profile, the lightly gritty tannins, the juicy acids, the slightly sweeter fruit than expected. You know, when I smelled it, I thought it was going to be a little bit more, a little bit more tense, a little bit more uh, gritty on the palate. But there's a, there's a sweetness to the fruit here that I'm going to use as, as uh, my, my final determining factor on the origin of the variety. Unless, of course, it's Gamay, as Sarah was, was uh, alluding to. Well, well, we'll find out if she's right eventually. All right, we're going to go back over to Michael. Michael, what is wine number three? Actually, John, I, I don't think that's what uh, Sarah was alluding to. I think she was alluding to César. Uh, <laughs> that's what you were talking about. Exactly, so, exactly. <laughs> you really in fact, it wouldn't shock me if this were a northern uh, Bourgogne um, Pinot with some Cesar in it, but we're just splitting hairs by talking about that. So Pinot Noir, France, Bourgogne, just general AOC, Bourgogne, uh, 2018. For this quality, I'd like to say 20-ish, 24, $24. Oh, okay, cool, fantastic, thank you, Michael. All right, over to David next. David, what is wine number three? Okay, well, it is Pinot Noir. Um, and Burgoyne was my second guess. Uh, and again, I'm a little bit torn because it really reminds me of a, like a Haute Cote de Bourgogne or, or something like that, Haute Cote de Nuit, right? It's got that regional burgundy character. Uh, so I'm almost ready to say that's what it is. But again, the ripeness of fruit that John alluded to, and I was getting it too, the sort of raspberry in there, which is a signature to me that it's a slightly warmer climate. So I'm coming back to Canada. Uh, obviously, Niagara would be a good guess, but I'm going to BC, uh, the Okanagan Valley, the Northern Okanagan, uh, where they tend to get just a little bit more sunshine. Um, and it's probably, it's a fairly young one, uh, 2000 and uh, I'll say 2018 and about $25. Fantastic. Thank you, David. And we are going to go over to Sarah. Sarah, what is wine number three? This has to be Pinot Noir. Um, at first sip, I, I actually did have a little gamma impression, but very quickly I was uh, into the uh, the Pinot camp, um, given uh, the level of oak and, and, and just a little bit more tan and a little bit more texture. Um, and, um, and, and this dried, leafy, slightly leathery component to this wine. Um, but I think it's Canadian. I actually do think it's Canadian here. And um, I, I, I agree with David that this is probably from BC. This feels, there's something about it that feels new world in the character and the ripeness of the fruit here and the perfume. So I'm going to go with um, the Okanagan Valley British Columbia, 2019 Pinot Noir. And um, I'm going to say that the price is $29. Thank you so very much, Sarah. And we are going over to John. John, what is wine number three? I was either in Oregon, in Canada, or in a warm vintage in Burgundy but I've eliminated Burgundy. I've eliminated the Willamette in Oregon, although I think that's still a pretty good guess. So I'm uh, back in Canada, gonna go with my first impression where you get a little bit of old world, new world in the Niagara Peninsula, more than in B 
BC, I think it's 2018 Niagara Escarpment, more specifically, that's got a little bit of bench uh, limestone happening. And, uh, you know, it's is pretty good quality wine. I'm going to pony up $35 for this bottle. Fantastic. All right. Is everybody ready to see what this wine is? Everyone's ready? I know. Let's, let's uh, find out what wine number three is. All right. So wine number three is the Hidden Bench Pinot Noir Again. 2019. <laughs> it's from Ontario. It's from the Niagara Peninsula. It's from the Escarpment area in the Beamsville Bench region, 2019. And the price is $34.95. And let's get our scoring wizards to bring up the score right away. Hey, John. John, you have overtaken Michael. You are now at 20 points. Michael is directly behind you at 18, followed by Sarah and followed by David. Congratulations, John. You've pulled into the lead a little bit. This is absolutely awesome. So we're going to take that down. Thank you very much, Scoring Wizards. All right. So uh, let's go over to some questions for the chat. I'm going to start with a question for John, since you were the winner from this round. Now that you know what the wine is, would you suggest cellaring this wine? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I How would long? like to see this wine in, I mean, it's quite delicious now, but for me, Pinot needs to evolve a little bit. I'd like to see a little bit more underbrush and a little less fruit. So, you know, not, not uh, decades, I think two, three years would probably put this in a pretty sweet drinking window. So 2022, 2023, and you could, if you wanted to stretch it, uh, take it to the end of the decade, I think probably without uh, issue. I think that's a great plan to have for this particular wine. <laughs> Uh, Sarah and David, I want to go to you guys because you, you are, you're on a theme this evening with the two of you. You've answered similarly on wines before. You both said BC this time around. What, what took you there? Well, for me, it was, as I said, a uh, little, little bit of extra ripeness, but, but that's such a tricky thing. So ripeness is a product of vintage conditions. And the one thing about uh, Ontario in particular and BC too is very, very vintage sensitive regions, right? Uh, there's there's a lot of vintage variation. Uh, so this 2019, it was a pretty good year, pretty warm year. So that's that's accounting for that. Um, and uh, by the way, 2020 is is being said to be a great vintage in Niagara as well. And in my Canadian Wine Insider column coming up this month, I'm going to do a 2020 vintage report across Canada. So you can watch for that. Um, but yeah, that's it was I was simply tricked by the ripeness of the fruit. It, you know, ripeness of fruit is quite tricky. Sarah, I have a different question for you. Um, this question is, how does the lack of filtering affect this wine? This wine is an unfiltered wine. So how does the lack of filtering affect the wine, the final wine in the bottle? Yeah, so <clears throat> at the end of the winemaking process or uh, finding actually happens throughout, but filtering uh, generally near the end of the, the winemaking process. And um, there are different types of filtrations and there are different uh, tightnesses of filtration too, right? So you could, if you have a really kind of tight filtration, you're going to potentially strip out a little bit more of from the wine in terms of, of flavor and texture than you would um, you would otherwise if it wasn't filtered. Um, so I mean you can you can also filter very judiciously and still retain quite a bit. Um, you might notice if there's no filtration a little bit of cloudiness in the bottle that's something that you might uh, you might see. Um, usually it's a, a subtle difference um, but um, some people prefer to or some producers prefer not to filter the wine. Uh, usually this isn't done for large commercial production it's usually done for smaller lots. Mm -hmm. And I have a last question that's going over to Michael and then we're going to move on to our wine number four for the evening. Michael, since you answered Burgundy, can you just say like, like, just like a quick hit list of the stylistic differences between France, California, and Oregon Pinots? Like what are like the one thing from France that would stand it out to you? One thing from California, one thing from Oregon. So, I mean, there's, there, there's a, a blurring of lines between all places now. We all know that. So it, it, it's, it's, pretty hard to generalize that way. But for me, at, at, at sort of the AOC level, meaning the non-clima, non D, non-single vineyard, you know, not elevated in the Bourgogne, there's this, um, as I said, this, this, this kind of tension and astringency and, and attack that I get from those wines. So that to me is interesting that I noticed it in this wine, but that must say something about the winemaking acumen of Jay Johnston at uh, Hidden Bench and um, what he's doing there. Uh, in terms of um, California, 
you're mu I mean, ri much richer palate, much more hedonism involved, riper fruit, higher alcohol. Um, generally speaking, California Pinot Noir will really stand out. And Oregon is, is really a, an entity to itself. It's closer to California than anything else, but really fantastic multifarious soils in Oregon. So, you know, sedimentary soils, loose soils, volcanic soils. I mean, there's so much di different differentiation in the soils in Oregon that um, you get a lot more interesting minutia and complexity in those wines and they stand out because of those, I, you could call them eccentricities, but just, they're just not like Californian and Burgundian wines. They're different. It is How's a different place. And thank you very much, yes. Michael, for that. And uh, John, you have many people in the audience that are vying for for your uh, you to get higher points. And uh, to the person that has asked that question, it was a difference of vintage. And the scoring wizard will be happy to type his answer to you to tell you why John did not get 10 points. Although I'm sure John and you wish, wishes that he did. All right, so we are going to move on to wine number four. I had to double check to see which wine we're on. Everybody, if you could just show your bottles right. to the audience. And audience members, if I didn't get to your question this time around, I am so sorry. Please submit it to questions at winealign.com. We're going to move our critics into the critics lounge so that we can find out what the wine is before they do. All right. So our fourth wine of the evening is the Trius Red, the Icon. It is the 2018 vintage. It is a blend of Cabernet Franc, Merlot, and Cabernet Sauvignon. It's from my Ontario. It's just from the general Niagara Peninsula. There's no additional uh, appellations here. The vintage, like I said, is 2018 and the price is $24.95. And again, this is sponsored by Wine Country Ontario. We do have a theme going on. Welcome back critics. And just to remind you guys that you guys are all coming back on mute. So if you could just unmute yourselves whenever you are ready. I know we're, we're having some some tough wines this evening, don't you say, critics? All right, yeah. so let's uh, let's go over to David first for this one. David, what are your first thoughts on wine number four? Okay, well, again, I, I really like this. Uh, we've certainly stepped up in terms of, of weight from, from the previous Pinot Noir. We're into sort of a, a mid-weight uh, red. Uh, again, I'm really liking the complexity on the nose here. Um, it's a nice raspberry fruit, a little bit plummy, herbs, tobacco, spice, and everything's at a nice level with each other. That's what I, I, I love the integration of the aromatics on this wine. Uh, it's it's mid-weight, it's uh, quite, still pretty firm, it's pretty youthful, uh, but the balance is still good. I mean, the tannins are a little bit elevated for now, but it's a young wine, so you expect that. Um, but overall, I think the balance is good and the, and the length is, is very good to excellent. Fantastic. Thank you so much, David. We're going to go over to Sarah next. Sarah, what are your first thoughts on wine number four? Yeah, I'm honing in on the grape variety here. I think it's actually a single grape variety. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, it's, um, it's a variety that has, uh, th that's showing a little bit of an herbal character to it. It's something that has good tannic presence. Um, there's a lot of red fruit, but also some black fruit in this, in this wine. Um, so well structured. There's a, a good bit of oak in this wine as well too. It's showing some really toasty notes to it that give it almost the impression of sweetness. Um, given its its tannic presence, I think that I think that and and looking at the, at the glass, I think that maybe it, it has a couple of years of age on it, but it's not an old old wine. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I'm in a, I'm now I'm in a local fra frame of mind. <laughs> All right, uh, Sarah's clearly on a, a track. Let's go over to John. John, what are your first thoughts on wine number four? That there's a conspiracy afoot. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, no, the, I mean the family of varieties here. Uh, you know, it's already been said we're we're in a in a slightly herbal, plummy zone here. So the Bordeaux varieties come to mind immediately. The weight, the color, all sort of point in that direction as well. Wood pretty dominant, as Sarah said, there's a creamy sort of vanilla uh, sensation. So, uh, you know, a, a slightly more commercial style of wine, but a very pleasing one. And tannins are, I don't, they're, they're, they're moderate. They're still a little grippy for now, but uh, nothing, nothing severe, nothing that a, a, another few months in bottle or year wouldn't sort out. So uh, yeah, I'm honing in on the origins now. 
Fantastic. I'll I'll, uh, I'll let you get to that in a moment. And uh, I'll go over to our next critic in just a moment. But guys, if you do have a question that that is in the, the chat box, you can always put in the put it in the question and answer box so I can see it and ask it to the critics if you would like it to be asked. And I am going on a first come first serve basis for this week and for today's show and answering it as uh, as concise questions as possible. So if you do have one, please put it in the questions and answers. And Michael, we're going over to you. What are your first thoughts on wine number four? Everybody's already said it. I don't have anything else to say. No, oh, that's not true. I'll say one or two things. Uh, yes, I'm kind of in the light version, cool climate version of the Bordeaux varietal spectrum-ish idea. Um, there's quite a bit of herbaceousness to this. Yes, that is very true. There, the oak is noticeable in the way that John said. Uh, I, I pretty much agree with all that. Um, it's, that was my first impression, and as I've said, I like to stick to my first impressions these days, so I probably will do so. Yeah, that's, that's probably a good idea. Um, probably, even if I'm going forward. <laughs> All right, so we're going to go back over to David. David, what is wine number four? Okay, well, not to waste too much time, because I think we're all, all pretty much on the same track. Uh, the only interesting thing here, uh, I, I agree it's Bordeaux varieties, is is it a blend, is it a single, and if it's a blend, what is the dominance? grape in the blend, and I'm going to call it as a Merlot-based uh, blend, but there's probably Cab Franc and maybe a bit of Cab Sauve as well. So Bordeaux Red, um, I think it's Niagara. Uh, there seems to be a conspiracy afoot. Um, and um, yeah, so Niagara, and more specifically, Four Mile, um, Four Mile Creek, which is the warmer area in the Niagara Peninsula, sort of where these red varieties, these Bordeaux varieties grow quite well. Um, Vintage, uh, again, youthful. I'm going to just say 2017. Uh, still got a ways to go, as John said, and I'm going to go about $30. Thank you very much, David. We're going to go over to Sarah. Sarah, what is wine number four? Well, I think that this is, um, I think that this is a Cabernet Franc and uh, 2018, is it 2017 or 2018 is the, is the tricky part here. Um, I'm going to say 2017 Cabernet Franc from Niagara. And I think maybe um, in the kind of Niagara River area, probably. And the price on this one, I think given the, um, the, the oak treatment on this wine and the intensity, it's probably about $34. All right, fantastic. And we are going over to John. John, what is wine number four? I'm going to split the difference uh, between Merlot and, and Cab Franc and call it a Cab Merlot. Okay. I'm not going to specify Franc or Sauvignon because uh, that's the way we do things in Ontario. So just straight up Cab Merlot, 2000. And uh, uh, here's the tricky thing. 18, I'm going to go. Uh, I think it's from the Niagara Peninsula. I'm not sure about uh, Ormond Creek or, or Escarpment area. That's kind of got me pausing there for a moment. But I, I'm going to, do I have to go far? Do I have to go that? I'm going to no, say not. You don't have to get us an appellation if you don't want to. That's entirely up to you. Yes. Okay. I see what you're saying. You're, you're putting pressure on me now, Renee. Yeah, no, I think it's. Uh, that is literally my job. <laughs> I think it's, uh, I think it's from the Escarpment. I think it's from the Escarpment 2018, $25 Cab Merlot. There we go. Fantastic. And Michael, Michael, what is wine number four? So, oh, I am so torn between Merlot and Cabernet Franc, I have to tell you. I don't really think there's any Cab Sauve in this. So, but I don't think it's a wine that would just be Merlot or Cab Franc. So I got to pick one or the other. And this herbaceousness, it's more herbal than verdant. There's a, there's a big difference. So I'm going to say it's Cab Franc. I think it's Cabernet Franc, uh, Canada, Ontario. I think it's from the Lincoln Lakeshore. I think it's from that side. And I think it's 2017. And I'll say $27. All right. So critics, are we ready to find out what wine number four is? All right. Let's see what we got. We have the... Trius Red Icon 2018. It is a blend of Cabernet Franc, Merlot, and Cabernet Sauvignon. It's from Ontario. It's from the Niagara Peninsula. That's it. And it is 2018. Price is $24.95. I'm going to get the scoring wizards to come up right away. 
And there we go. We have uh, we had a lot of scores coming up now. We have John in the lead. It might have been because he said the cab Merlot, as we often do here in Ontario, followed by Michael, followed by Sarah, and followed by David. We got a lot going on with our scores tonight as we are heading into our final wine. Thank you very much, Scoring Wizards. You guys can take that down. Um, so lot, I think uh, I think you guys have all uh, gotten onto a page here, which is quite nice. So uh, we are going to start with some questions. We have a very fun question that's that's here in our chat right now. And it is, how can the experts tell the finish if they spit out the wine? Who would like to answer this question? I would question? love to answer that. I Go ahead, to David. That. I've had so many students ask that question. <laughs> and, and there's a real logic, of course, you know, how can you tell the finish if you don't swallow? Because there, there are no, uh, you know, taste buds or, or anything happening in your throat at all. Once it's past your mouth cavity and this retronasal passage that connects the roof of your mouth back up to your, uh, your uh, I was going to say oligarchy, <laughs> olfactory, olfactory uh, senses, um, nothing happens. You just got to have the liquid going down your, your gullet, right? So all the sensorial things are happening when the wine is in your mouth. Uh, and once you've swallowed, then you start counting and you can literally take a stopwatch and see how long you're still af after smelling that wine in your, up in your, your, uh, in your brain. That's how you measure length to finish. Thank you so, so much, David. That's amazing. I'm going to go over to Michael. Michael, because I think you were the person that said this. Can you please explain the difference between herbal and verdant? <laughs> yes. Yeah, you knew that was going to be a question once you said it. So so things that are verdant to me are, are plant-based, but not herb-based, meaning smelling things like ferns or... Um, or, or water plants like, like cress or lilies or things like that. There's a smell to wet green plants that to me is a verdancy. And then there's a herbaceousness, which refers to herbology, which refers to herbs, basil, tarragon, sage, rosemary, whatever you want to call it. And I find in my estimation, I try to kind of check the difference between things like Merlot, which is a verdancy to me, and Cabernet Franc, which is a herbaceousness. Thank you very much, Thank Michael. You. That's a great answer to that question. And I have uh, two questions here that came up that I'm just going to answer really quickly for everyone. Uh, when it comes to wineries from Niagara, do the critics prefer those that have their own vineyards or not? I, I honestly, it depends on the person who's managing the vineyard. And I think I can answer for everybody by saying that, that it, it really doesn't matter who has the vineyard. It's the vineyard manager that's really important in that case, especially for virtual wineries. Uh, otherwise, you get to know the person who's the vineyard manager at the winery itself. And are whites easier than reds? Depends on the palate, depends on the person. Who knows that they're, 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 some people find them easier than not, some other people do. Uh, so those are done there. We have a, two other questions that are coming in from here and then we're gonna move on to wine number five. I'm gonna go over to John on this one and then we'll go over to Sarah afterwards. Uh, so John, how do you know from the label or otherwise whether wine number four is from Four Mile Creek, Lincoln Lakeshore or the Escarpment? Well, I don't have the label, but I'm pretty sure you don't know because it just says VQA Niagara Peninsula. Is that correct? Yes. Which means that uh, it is uh, most likely a blend from across the, the peninsula. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm pretty sure that's what Trias does, but uh, um, that's a really great wine. It's a representative wine of, of Ontario in the Bordeaux varietal spectrum. Uh, you know, it's got enough of the green to make it Bordeaux, but it's also pleasing and ripe and soft and uh, got that little kiss of vanilla, which... Uh, uh, you know, amplifies the pleasure, I think. So yeah, it, it, if it doesn't say a more specific appellation, you can assume, it's not always the case, but you can assume that it's sourced from across the peninsula. Can I just add enough. one note here on this? Yeah. It's, it's kind of historic. I'm, and I have written this month in the Canadian Wine Insider about what, what was happening in Canada in the wine scene in 1991, 30 years ago. And 1991 was the first vintage of this wine. And it was oh, the first significant oh, Bordeaux blend to be made in Ontario. That's fantastic. I'll have to buy that for all of my younger cousins so that they can. But, uh, but commercially speaking, Niagara is a well-known name, much more so than Four Mile Creek or one of the yeah. other sub-appellation beams you'll have So, I mean, it could all be from one sub-appellation, but, you know, commercially, it makes sense to put Niagara Peninsula because that's what consumers recognize, people recognize. So it, it's tricky. You don't know for sure. 
Exactly. And I have one more question for Sarah, and then we're going to move on to wine number five. Uh, so as we know, a Bordeaux blend can be anything that is made from the Bordeaux grape varietals, which includes Cabernet Franc, Merlot, and Cabernet Sauvignon. I'm also answering the same question at the same time. So Sarah, how long do you think this, uh, what do you think of the quality of this wine, and how long do you think you could sell it for? You know what, I've tasted this wine blind before and I always overprice it when I'm guessing blind in this wine. I consistently do that. Um, so that leads me to believe that it's a good value. Um, but, uh, you know, this is, uh, so, so what was the question again? I can't remember what the question uh, was. So, this, so it's a good quality wine for the value. And the last, the last part of the question is how long would you sell her this wine for? Okay. How long would I sell this wine for? Um, I think it's drinking pretty well now. It does have a little bit of that tacky tannin. So you may just want to open it up and decant it a little bit in advance. I don't think you want to lose too much of the fruit here. It's nice and fresh and, and lovely. And it's not killer tannins, right? So I would uh, maybe decant it an hour before and, and serve it um, with some protein or something a little bit salty. You could still sell this. You still could keep this in your cellar for another few years. I think, you know, easily, probably three years, you'd be happy with it. And if you wanted to risk it a little bit further than then keep it a little bit longer um but yeah it's it's got a lot of stuffing here so definitely does all right critics we're gonna move on to our last wine of the evening i know we've, we've kept you guys going for so long please showcase your last vial of mystery to the audience and we are going to move you guys into the critics lounge as our last wine is the Featherstone Cabernet Franc 2018 vintage. It's 100% Cabernet Franc. It's coming from the Ontario, just the Niagara Peninsula itself. The vintage is 2018 and the price is $19.95. Again, thank you Wine Country Ontario for sponsoring this wine to us this evening. All right, so we are going to kick things off with our critics and I'm gonna give them a moment to just understand the wines in their glass just slightly more. We're going to kick it off with Sarah. What are your first thoughts on wine number five? Um, all right. So there are two little markers here for me. One of them was graphite, which I picked up on the nose in this particular wine. And um, that's that's a trigger for me for a particular Bordelais variety. Often. Um, I'm trying to... to I'm feeling like this last wine can't be, well, I guess it could be a ringer somewhere outside of the country if they just wanted to be mean. Um, but I, I do think that it has um, enough acidity and, and, and enough of a modern, I like how John put it, old world uh, meets new world, kind of a, a character to it that it could very likely be uh, local as well. So um, I'm... Right now, I'm thinking it has the potential to be a Bordeaux variety, um, but I need a little bit more time with it. Okay, well, you have more time. You have four people for more, three more people in front of you for more time. So we're gonna go over to John next. John, mm -hmm. what are your first thoughts on wine number five, our last wine of the night? What are your first thoughts on it? Great wine, loving this Great. wine. Love the tension here, love the energy on the palate, love the balance, love the succulence, love those juicy acid, love the interplay between fruit and some subtle wood and a little bit of herbal, or is it verdant, herbal, verdant? You know, if you know what I'm talking about, bushy character, that's not fruit. Um, you know, this is, this is polished, well-made wine from a good site by a good winemaker. That, that's what I'm gonna say. Fantastic. All right, we're gonna go over to Michael. Michael, uh, debate aside between herbal and verded, what is your uh, what are your first thoughts on wine number five? This one is both. Okay, great. I'll tell you why. <laughs> both, John, because there's a little bit of finocchio, a little bit of fennel in it. There's a little bit of rosemary in it. Um, you know, a little verdant, a little herbal. It's got both. So there's it's almost Italian, isn't it? But Oh, can I just say what it is? Canada, Ontario. Oh, okay. Look, we all know where this is going. We all know the thematic of this. We're not going to fall into that trap in wine number five, but also mint, spearmint. Does anybody get that along with the graphite? I get the graphite for sure, but there's almost a minty character to it. Love it. It's, um, it's a special wine. We, we've pushed Michael into a new way of describing his first thoughts of the wine, and I, I am in for it. Yeah. All right, All we're right. gonna go over to David. David, what are your first thoughts on wine number five? Well, assuming a 
we're on theme here, and I think we are. It's a quite different wine from number four, isn't it? Even though it's from the same place, right? Uh, and the same set of grape varieties. Again, it's a Bordeaux blend. Which grape is leading? I'm not sure. I have an inkling given, you know, things like graphite and a little bit of mint and that, that kind of thing. But uh, again, I like the tension of it. And I think it's something that, um, you know, it's got, it's got ripeness. It's, it's got more ripeness than the previous wine. The, the, the fruit is riper. There's a bit of florality in it as well. Uh, Well-handled oak. Uh, good again, good tension on the palate, uh, not thick and heavy and ponderous in any way, but but really good flavors and very good length, excellent length, excellent. Fantastic, thank you very much, David. All right, we're going back over to Sarah. Sarah, you said you needed more time. I have provided you with it. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> what is good. wine number five? Oof. Well, this is a tricky one, and I'm not as confident as in my answer as I was for the previous wines. That's for sure, because I'm trying to figure out if this is a var an another variety altogether than what I was, I was thinking, trying to come up with this variety that would actually make all of this make sense. You know, sometimes it's just a piece, a couple pieces of the puzzle missing. Um, but given my need to answer quickly, I will say that this seems to me like a really supple, inviting red. Um, and perhaps a blend of Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon, although it doesn't have that intensity of the tannin. Um, it's, it's a little bit riper. Um, boy, okay, so I will give this a, a vintage of uh, 2017, uh, this blend uh, from Niagara Peninsula, and the price on it being uh, $27. Thank you very much, Sarah. All right, we're going over to John. John, what are, what is wine number five? Wine number five is clearly a 2017 vintage Niagara Peninsula Cabernet Franc on its own, just doing its thing, doing its wonderful thing in our beautiful, cool climate. And, uh, I'm, I'm loving this wine. I'm going to pay $35 happily for it. Where in the peninsula? I know I don't have to go, but I might go. I mean, this for me, uh, it's kind of Lincoln Lakeshore-ish. Lincoln Lakeshore, 2017, $35 Cabernet Franc. Thank you very much, John. We're going to go over to Michael. Michael, what is wine number five? So I think it's Cabernet Franc, but I think there are some other grapes in it. Uh, I think there's some Cab Sauvin here. So I'm going to say Cabernet Franc lead, but, but a blend. I think it's from 2017. I think it's Niagara Peninsula. I'm not going to go any more specific than that. But I think this is, I think this is tops. I'm, I'm almost tempted to say $50, but I'm going to say $48. All right, there were some big words there for that one. I, mm -hmm. All right, we're going to go into David. David, what is wine number five? Well, I'm almost exactly exactly the same comments as, as Michael. Um, I believe it's, it's a Bordeaux red, probably Cab Franc lead with maybe a little bit of, of Cab Sauve as well, and maybe some Merlot. Uh, 2017, uh, it is um, from the Niagara River Appalachian, I think. Uh, and um, it's again, I think it's exp expensive. I'm gonna, I was, was I gonna say 50, and I'll go to 45. Fantastic, keeping the options open. I absolutely love it. And uh, we are getting, let's figure out what wine number five is. Everybody ready to see it? Seeing if we're on theme with the evening, or maybe we threw you a curveball. Who knows? Um, so the last wine of the night is the Featherstone wow. Cabernet Franc. 2018 vintage, 100% Cabernet Franc wow. production from Ontario, from the Niagara Peninsula, and it is 1995. Wow. Good job. There we go. Fantastic. So we are going to pull up our scoring wizard right now to just get into that really, really quickly. Scoring wizard, if you could just start sharing it. All right. So we got John as the winner for the evening. You turned it around, man. We got uh, 37 points for you. Michael, you are still in second place at 32, followed by Sarah and followed by David. Uh, congratulations to all of you. I'll get you guys to take that down, Scoring Wizard, please. And it only took you to the fourth wine to figure out the theme of the evening. Yeah. 
Which kind of was I kind of really thinking after two, but didn't want to play the card. <laughs> You're like, I know what it is. I am, I'm fairly certain about this. All right, we got we got a we got some uh, questions that have come into the chat over here, and uh, and some that are really really quite interesting. So I want to go over to Michael since you were the first person to say this. What made you think that this wine was a lot higher priced than it is? It's a beauty, beautifully balanced wine. The fruit is great. There's fine tannin to it. It doesn't hit you over the head. You can drink it now. The acidity is great. There's no real, real um, over the top volatility to it. It's really in balance. It's an impressive wine and it drinks double the price that it is. I'm, I'm really impressed with that. I think it's a, I think it's a tour de force. It's a, it's a, it's tops. That's what I said. I'm really impressed by it. That's absolutely amazing. Yep. I have two questions that I'm just going to address quickly. Uh, the difference between Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc are that they are different grapes and they provide different flavors in the glass. And for the 2020 vintage, we are going. I'm just going to refer you guys to all of the new things that Wine Align will be writing about the 2020 vintage in the soon coming little while. So for anybody that has questions on those, please refer to Wine Align for the 2020 vintage um, and the vintage thoughts that they have. I wanted to go over to uh, to actually let let's go over to David on this one. David, if you could choose one grape in Niagara to make, what would it be as a winemaker? Uh, as a wine consumer, which is consumer, my perspective, maker, drinker, <laughs> yeah. whatever you yeah. like. No, I I I think, uh, and it's and this is widely debated in Ontario, uh, but I think that Ontario's single best variety is Chardonnay. Uh, and I know we've got a great history with Riesling and we've had a great Riesling tonight. And, and so it's right on the heels, but I just think there's something special about uh, Niagara Chardonnay from the limestone soils with some vine age and really careful winemaking that puts it world-class, which is what the International Cool Climate Chardonnay celebration has, has proven over the years, actually. Thank you so very much, David. That's a great answer to pick. And I'm gonna go over to Sarah for this one. Uh, this, this question, I'm just going to read it out loud the way that it is. What is it about your palates do you believe that enables you to distinguish the differences between so many different types of wines and gives you the ability to tell when it's a blend or not? Wow. Okay. That's, that's a I, like point. I said, I'm just going to read it. It's I will say, I, okay, just a couple of things. Maybe I can uh, summarize the response is tasting. The more that you taste, uh, the more you get a feel and understand for that. So, you know, if you're tasting 50, 60 wines uh, or 30, whatever, how, we taste quite a bit a day and it does help build up that mental data bank of, uh, of wines and what you can expect from different regions, different varieties. Um, so I think the more that you taste, the more helpful. In one sense though, um, your bias is greater as well, the more you taste. So that's one thing that, that I think a lot of experienced tasters maybe struggle with is that, is that, that bias. But you know, that's, that's the main reason that we're able to distinguish those. And I just wanted to make a comment on how interesting this night was. And, and I'm so glad that all of you got to taste these wines. And I hope it really changed some perspectives uh, for, for a lot of people here that we can make wines. And, you know, we, we've been comparing these wines all night to other great winemaking regions in the world. And um to be able to showcase the fact that these, you know, there are comparable wines made in some of the best wine regions in the world. I think, I hope that gives people more confidence to purchase uh, and, and be, you know, experiment with the, the diversity of wines that are out there in, uh, in Niagara, in Ontario. And thank you very much, Sarah. You make such a great point. My last question of the evening is going to go over to John. John, you haven't spoken this, this question round, so I'm going to throw one over to you. How hard is it as a critic to do five wines in rapid succession? I love the cadence of this, but how does that impact your ability to detect things that are going on in the glass? As Sarah just mentioned, you know, practice makes perfect and, and we do this quite a lot. And I can assure all of the, the viewers out there that if you did this as often as we did, uh, it, it, I mean, it, I'm not saying it's easy, but it's, you know, it's something that you just get accustomed to doing. So, you know, five wines is, is not that much when we're used to tasting 40, 50 wines a day. Not in this kind of scenario. I mean, we're having a lot of fun here, but uh, yeah, no, we can, we can manage. We're doing all right. We're hanging in there. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I know five wines sounds like a lot, but these guys do far more, everyone. Don't don't feel bad for them for just five wines. They just they do, however, not have to do it on camera in front of all of you, which is uh, which is nerve wracking within itself. And for everyone that is wondering, the wines are chosen by the wine line team, not these specific people on the wine line team but other human beings that work for Wine Align choose, uh, choose which wines they're gonna be tasting. But I wanted to thank my, the critics this evening. Thank you guys so much for, for going through the five wines with me tonight. And thank you, oh, Michael, go right ahead. I just wanna say one thing. I hope, I hope everybody out there sees what Niagara can do. I really, you know, you saw us thinking, thinking France, thinking Bourgogne, thinking Oregon, thinking California, thinking a lot of things. But um, we don't need to compare to those, to those things. So thank you to Wine Align for giving us this opportunity for everybody to be able to taste Niagara, for, for, like across the board for one night. The Wine Marketing Association of Ontario, Wine Country Ontario, obviously everybody, the, the, the farmers, the, the agriculturalists, the winemakers, everybody for doing such great work and, and allowing us to take part in showing it. That's yeah, tops. It's been a, right? it's been and, and I'm particularly glad that we didn't completely miss the boat either. I mean, that would have been really quite embarrassing for all of us. But, but no, we, we figured out the theme eventually. <laughs> I was I was honestly convinced that we would get to wine number three and you guys would have either figured it out or been like, they're trying to fuck with us. <laughs> Like that, that was my thought process with this the entire time. And I don't remember who had said, uh, who said it, but maybe at the end, it might've been a sheen on instead, who knows? But uh, that was a really fun evening. And everybody, please drink local, try local wines, support local, drink them, enjoy them. There's so much going on here and cheers critics. Thank you again so much. And thank you everybody for joining yeah, well, us. Thanks for joining us everyone. Thanks everyone. Great evening. Enjoy Great your dinner. Evening,